Legend says that as a child, the great warrior Achilles was dipped in the river Styx by his mother to make him invincible. However, she failed to immerse the ankle by which she held him. Despite his seeming invulnerability, the mighty warrior Achilles had a weakness, a fatal flaw that would bring about his ultimate demise. In ancient times, philosophers and scientists struggled to understand their world. Today, that quest continues through observation and experiment. But from the beginning, our observations have always been interpreted through a lens, an already established belief about where we came from. Throughout history, people have often come to conclusions they thought were irrefutable like the idea that the Earth was the center of the solar system, only to have those ideas come crashing down. History shows that mistakes were often made through incorrect interpretations of our world. So, can science really answer the big underlying questions of where did the universe come from? How did it all begin? Can science lead us to the ultimate source of all knowledge? Today, evolution is believed by many to be an unquestionable fact, as impervious to attack as Achilles in his golden armor. But there are scientists today who have looked at the evidence and have come to very different conclusions about where we came from. We're now going to look at the main pillars of evolutionary theory through the eyes of 15 PhD scientists. After closely examining the alleged evidence, they have found fatal flaws. Evolution's Achilles Heels. Most people see natural selection as the main engine of evolution. This supposedly slow and gradual mechanism drives changes in the way species look and behave over time. It's also commonly called survival of the fittest, but that's a little confusing because it's not always the biggest and the strongest who survive. In reality, natural selection is all about reproduction. The organism that had the most descendants in later generations was, by definition, the fittest, and that usually comes about because some variation in the organism helped it to be more suited to its environment than others. So everybody talks about natural selection, and they kind of almost imagine like it's a magic wand, it's an explanation for everything. Natural selection is simply differential reproduction. In all living systems, in all populations, some individuals reproduce more than others. That is natural selection. As an example from my work in soil microbiology, particularly with pesticide degradation, if we had pesticide 
to a source system to kill weeds, insects, or diseases, within that bacterial population, there is a portion that can degrade or utilize that pesticide as a carbon or nitrogen source to grow. So that over time, you had a change in this population, but natural selection did not bring about any new features. Uh, it was already in the population. The first time that I saw a creation presentation on natural selection, I was just amazed at my blindness prior to that in not realising that natural selection can only operate on whatever is existing and it can only operate to remove what is existing. And so the realisation that it doesn't actually produce new genetic information uh, was an absolute bombshell to me. So natural selection is actually a convenient term to use just to describe this process by which uh, creatures, organisms not suited to the environment are eliminated, those which are suited survive. So natural selection is not the same as evolution. The survival of the fittest does not explain the arrival of the fittest. If natural selection only selects from what's already in the population, then how does evolutionary progress occur? Mutations are the evolutionists hoped for engine of evolution. And if that's mutations increasing the genetic information, is this Darwinian process, mutation plus selection, is that a creative process? In fact, is that the creative process? And the answer is, it's not a creative process. The mutation selection process is only useful for fine-tuning systems. And that's what we see in biology. If we consider the most common examples of evolution, the ones you see in the textbooks and things, these are not due to some new feature being added, but breaking existing features. For example, uh, warfarin resistance in rats or DDT resistance in mosquitoes, loss of sight in cave fish and cave salamanders, loss of functional wings in beetles on a windy island. In all these cases, things are broken by mutation and natural selection is involved in selecting them. But getting rid of them is, happens to be adaptive. But people say, hang on, I see new species appearing. Isn't that a proof of evolution? Well, not really, because it's not a problem for a creationist. Both the creation and evolution models predict the appearance of new species. What I mean is that God apparently created animals that were designed to diversify over time. So you, you look at red wolves and gray wolves. Obviously, they're wolves. They came from a common ancestor. But all we would say is that they came from two wolf-like creatures that came off of Noah's Ark. Now, the real problem is defining what a species is. I mean, keep in mind, species, species is the word, it's a man-made word, and boundaries between species are often blurry. Scientists use the word in multiple ways. I mean, it, geologists, they tend to separate fossils into different species based on the way they look. But biologists sometimes say things belong to the same species if they can interbreed regardless of how they look. If you think about it, both sides of the creation and evolution debate predict the formation of new species. Therefore, even though the appearance of new species is necessary for evolutionary theory, it cannot be proof of evolution if the creationist model can make the same prediction. Let me give you another example. I, I've been to the Galapagos Islands. I, I've seen the marine iguanas and the land iguanas. They, they look different, they act different, they live in different environments, they eat different things. They've been labeled as two distinct separate species by the evolutionists, and they claim they've been separated for millions of years. Yet hybrid offspring between the two species exists, and they're easy to find, so they look different, but they can interbreed. Obviously, they came from a single founding species that made it to those islands, but are they really separate species? And it's not just among iguanas. We've seen hybridizations between false killer whales and dolphins, donkeys and zebras, polar bears and grizzlies, lions and tigers. And many of these crosses produce fertile offspring.
When Darwin went to the Galapagos, he collected information about finches and he was looking for change over time. It wasn't until quite some time later, thinking about it, he realised the finches he saw there probably, almost certainly, were derived from finches on the mainland. But they're just variations of finches. And in fact, today we know that many of them can interbreed, so they shouldn't even be called different species. So this is not an example of evolution in the sense of microbes to mankind. Darwin's basic concept in his tree diagram was a tree of life, that all living things today go back to one common ancestor. But creationists have the idea, our idea is that uh, we can trace things back to basic kinds, not one, but many different basic kinds that were created and they've adapted and speciated and so on to give what we see today. So instead of a tree, creationists see it more of an orchard where each tree in the orchard is a basic kind from which the branches actually are the species and things we see today. And ad adaptation and natural selection are involved in that process. I think that nature has been created to be able to modify itself and fitting the circumstances where living organisms are. We see a lot of variation potential in nature, but real novelties are not there. People talk about different species and speciation in nature. That's something that we can observe, but it is not the same thing as creating novel structures, novel information. I don't see that. You can imagine that you have a, a front-loaded organism with all these, these genes, and you can then argue that, okay, in this particular environment, you can lose that part of genes. In the other environment, with, with other selection pressure, with other conditions, you can... While it's true that mutations can sometimes create new traits, they generally only work to destroy existing traits and information. So, when a new trait called sickle cell anemia arose in Africa, it allowed people to survive malarial infections. It was a new trait, but the hemoglobin gene was broken in the process. Likewise, many examples of antibiotic resistance of bacteria deal with broken genes for transporting things into the cell. The reason that the bacteria can live is because the transporter gene is broken, the poison can't get in. It's easier to break something than to create something new. Natural selection plus mutation actually works in the wrong direction for evolution. So the question is, how does evolution work? <laughs>